This is called Elegy for a Poet. One day you came to walk with me down to the Embarcadero when there were still a few old wooden diners where the long foreman would eat. There'd be some old men who lived through the Depression and the Great Strike. You could order a mountain of hash browns and bacon as thick as a wrist and as tough. They had corned beef hash and coffee made in the far precincts. And we chose one of those places. I said, Reggie, it's not Oakland, but it's just as endless. The bellboys out on Raccoon Straits the rampant pace of fog combing Alcatraz, and you said, this city could be a beautiful ruin. Like that, as the waitress served marvelous eggs and toast burnt all the way through so that it cracked when you sliced it down the middle. Well, did we not talk of the Harlem Renaissance and Whitman's aged hand and boats on the bay and the docks in Alameda and the Oakland Tribune and the seagulls once we got walking toward the Bay Bridge. You told me that the lights might be fading, yet there's a way. There's miles and monk and a good night's sleep. There's greatness in the small things right before us on the street, things we might not notice another time around. <coughs> we didn't have computers. I call them magic slates in order to feel a sense of the word crawling like an animal. We had just ourselves, Reggie, big and sweet, luminous and as antique as what one feels when the enchantments come down from the poem and land on two feet. Yes, I do feel as I might reach out like that day Sharon and I found you in a convenience store in your town. You pointed to your family home, now lovely as the trees. Now you are gone and we're both old, an old woman and an old man. There is rouge all over the sun and filth in the throat of things. Poetry, I think, may lie, but only a little bit at a time. Mostly it follows us to a sense of our fragile selves in the rhythm. We may lean back to observe the branches on a steady breeze or follow humility to the prize, which is forever beyond reach. I called a friend in San Jose today and, and John Landry, a wonderful poet, and he uh, was at a laundromat, and all of a sudden I heard, caw, caw, it was a, it was a uh, crow. And, and that was fantastic to hear the crow speaking to me on the telephone. And you'll see why. When the crow and I are alone, in memory of Miriam Patchen. <clears throat> when the crow and I are alone, life is much easier. He alights onto my shoulder and listens to the traffic as a crow must do in order to survive. He keeps a list of other birds on a tablet in his heart. I scream and the crow caws. I rage and the crow ruffles his feathers. A people must understand what is important in the life of a crow. Love is important and thus I offer mine. A man and a crow, the crow in ceremonial song. Come along and speak to the bird. He has a hallway all his own. He loves the gold chain in his cage. He likes to come out and fly in his hall. One day he took me up to the sky, out of my window <coughs> and soared, over the low fog, and the other crows gathered in flight, persistent. Look into the mind of this universe. Take your storage boxes and toss the souvenirs into the sky. Crow is not a god. Crow is not a medallion. The crow is not a charm. He will look for seed on my open palm. He will roost on a branch of the cold tree. We sit around together. He wrote this poem in order to save himself. 
He looks for redemption. He says, Miriam, dear Miriam, so long ago, now you are a plant in the window, the great talons of this crow. I feel his power when sleep comes rushing into the room. The dark is like his feathers. I see the cruel white hand of night and my forehead beaded in sweat. Beware of the sound when the fog is moving. You know he rests alongside all the crows imaginable. And they are beautiful and primitive, just as we are primal and dangerous, heading forever toward disaster. This is what the fire is for, not only for warmth. Here in the cold, it is possible to believe that one may die a better way, not suffer so much, make it easy to disappear. The crow comes into the room. He flies into the room and I shut the window. Dear Miriam, there is a reason and I have held it in hand. The crow is alive. I say the drums are going like mad when the crow and I are alone. Thoughts at 67. This is easy now that I'm 68. Absurd, yes, I am. Early to rise, there is little excuse, no denying how lucky the moon has been all of my life. And even before, it hangs where it must. It shines as it will, just as the sun does, and galaxies beyond. I missed out, yes, on the rough tarmac. My bag slipped open. Out came precious property. I amassed over time. A small blue book of Buddhist prose. A slim notebook filled with birds drawn in cherry black ink. A turquoise ring. Some fountain pens. Out came memories. A merry-go-round at Ocean Park when Harry Truman was president and my mother sold cosmetics door to door. Oh, I am older than the Yale younger poets. Beard as gray as Whitman's and just as capable of falling in love with handsome streetcar conductors. Grandmother Rose is back in Russia on a pony in the field under the eye of her father who milled grain. My father's on the boxcars prying open a can of beans to feed me as the rails hum. His friends have turned into fine white ash. They settle on the wings of a raven. I was short at age 13. Now almost everyone seems to tower over me. But way back then, so slim and every tooth in place, all those World War veterans teaching us, reading William Cullen Bryant and the Red Pony, stripping for Jim, the naked asses of my classmates, perfectly in place. It's not right. I should have done more, been better. But the dog is here. He curls up beside me and moans as I rub his belly. 67. It somehow doesn't fit. But I must live this way, walking onto the deck, meditating over the garden, tossing a dead beetle into the shadow of the banana bush. Senior, elder, old man, been around a while. The whales die, the bees pollinate, and the lemon tree stays sturdy. All is fine. A certain grace inspires light and amber shadows to emerge. My garden is clean and orderly, a miniature paradise for 29 years with the same man, loving his mind, counting his steps at night on the stairs. It's quite okay to face forward, to say, I'll write another book, I'll go to Innsbruck and recite my poems, I'll sleep at my friend's house in Tuscany, coffee as a prize when morning breaks over Carrara's Marble Hills. Tomorrow for Valentina Confido. This is the first poem I had in Italian and it was exciting to see it uh, in, in, in that other language which I don't read. So this is in English, of course. Tomorrow I will go there. 
Today we stop to think of the day we drove into town. There will be metal larks or cable cars, men with pale white arms on the wharf, the aged who now look at us from a limestone palace, a child holding an ice cream cone. What does it matter after the white ash over the hoods of cars parked by the conflagration? It is early morning, bright light. My memory is of the men who hobbled on Columbus Avenue. I was a tour guide for poets. I showered them with history and threw eucalyptus into their eyes. They knew how to distinguish between a cave lion and an empty gesture. I kissed them one by one and lingered by the tides. There will be a woman in exactly 2,500 years to address my solitude. I fall in love with walls of moonlight and think of her because the dawn has thrown my arms around her. You know she drives in the morning from one town to another. She has read the road map of Dante as would any well-meaning daughter. I am alone until the spirits surround me and then I am hardly <coughs> able to sit still. The poem is not capable of insincerity. It is not concerned with truth as such, but depends on form, a sea rock, some 400 yards out, a place for harbor seals. Maybe I address the sun god, but my passion is for lesser deities. Explain to Valentina that I arrived yesterday, that I have known the ways of women when I was a younger man, and now I sit behind the blinds in a deeper current. Thursday morning, poeta, greet the gray blanket of fog on this hillside for the grandeur of absolute equality, wrote Lamentia long ago on a tablet of Ezer. Bless the enigmatic light spilling onto the street. What more than words, single letters and silent places a brittle desire, the problem is not being able to listen and never quite knowing. We meet the world, the world disappears. Bright engines, slow clamor of love. I left so much reverie in the din. Now it is Thursday, the chill remains. Our deck has long yellow bamboo leaves and a wet patina. This is a love poem for scrub oak and the elusive wolverine. This fire I hand over, it is my dream to ring in the festivities like Shakespeare's puck if we shadows have offended while these visions did appear. And if you are able to remake my love, if you are walking on the brink, if empty sound is our final home, and if I may enter the song one more time, take my hand, hold this cup, allow the soaring birds to find their measure. The last poem at the Cafe Trieste, which a lot of you know. Now I sit in the cafe drinking espresso, thinking it's got to be okay. Me being contentious and ambitious and vain. Me being myself an old man but young when you consider that somewhere in what is now Indonesia we came of age, so some tell us, when we chewed leaves and dug up roots and hunted with stone. It has to be fine sitting here while the earth burns and the population spills into the sea, which will soon boil over anyway. I worry about Mozart and Bach, all those long hours composing music <laughs> for an ungrateful mob. That's how it is as I awaken in a fever every night, fearful of losing it and failing, falling down on a brick courtyard with no help in sight. I worry about the Louvre Museum, and all that art so vulnerable to a sudden nuclear attack or a major eruption on the sun. What's going to happen to my little cafe with its gossip and poetry? 
The hissing espresso machine echoes outside. I sip the fine, dark scrim and follow with cold water. It's all I've got now, this golden age, as an old friend described it. Listening to Italian arias on the cafe's jukebox and waiting for a solution to arise. I close my eyes and take one final sip, tasting the soil on a faraway estate and the interplay of sunlight and cloud forest. The cafe has been here since 1956. You'll find it when you want it, maybe, and maybe not, in a proper season, in this new age of splendor, on a crowded planet. All I ask is that you smile and lean back to taste the tenor of the sun. Thanks. Mm -hmm.